It's described as the largest rates rigging scandal in history. Senior management officials have resigned after Barclays Bank was found to be manipulating interest rates and fined $450 million. But can one bank do this alone? How wide is this web of financial deceit? And is it you who's losing the most? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mike Hanna. On Tuesday, Barclays chief executive Bob Diamond announced his resignation from the post with immediate effect in the wake of the bank rate rigging scandal. In a statement, Diamond, who faced mounting calls to step down, said he made the decision as the external pressure on the bank has reached a level that risks damaging the franchise. Barclays Bank was fined a record $450 million last week for attempting to manipulate the interbank lending rate LIBOR during the financial crisis between 2005 and 2009. Dominic Kane explains exactly what LIBOR is. It's a banking term that few people have heard of and even fewer will know much about, but one which impacts on many people's lives in one way or another. LIBOR, the London Interbank Offered Rate, is a measure of how much banks have to pay to borrow short-term loans from their rivals. It's worked out every day from estimates submitted by the major banks of their own interbank lending costs. The rate each bank must pay reflects their rival's perception of its financial strength. Every day, 16 banks submit the rate they borrow at and a median average of 8 provides the LIBOR rate. Together with its European equivalent, the Eurobor, they are benchmark references for all financial markets, reflecting the strength, or otherwise, of the banking sector. Many people rely on the LIBOR interest rates for their mortgages, for uh, borrowing money, and other people have contracts out on these LIBOR interest rates. So it is vital that this, uh, th this interest rate is correct. The price of trillions of financial transactions made every day around the world is set according to LIBOR. Among them, financial swap deals worth more than $350 trillion. And according to the British Bankers Association, loans totalling more than $10 trillion. So the suggestion that LIBOR may have been manipulated could already have caused very serious consequences. Dominic Kane, Al Jazeera. Well, Bill Black is a former director of the Institute for Fraud Prevention in the United States. He says the crisis could have been averted if regulators had kept a watchful eye. The regulators have never been involved in setting the rate, and indeed that was one of the claims as to why LIBOR was so good, right? That there wasn't governmental intervention because governmental intervention, it was argued, might lead to political uh, efforts to either keep the rate high, too high or too low. And supposedly this would be the pure market rate. What you've just seen is a cartel in operation which not maybe did exist and did distort LIBOR for the benefit of the largest banks in the cartel. It is the largest rigging of prices in the history of the world by many orders of magnitude. And since the banks have enormous positions measured in the trillions of dollars in some cases uh, that would stand to benefit or lose if LIBOR was higher or lower, they have a very strong incentive to move the number. By the way, that implies strongly that senior management would be involved and knowledgeable because in order to distort the LIBOR number to benefit the bank, you'd have to know a whole lot about the bank's net positions. So how widespread is this financial deception? And while one bank may be fined, how much does it cost you? To answer these questions, we're joined by our guests. In London, Philip Booth, Programme Director at the Institute of Economic Affairs and Professor of Insurance and Risk Management at Cass Business School. Also in London, Richard Reed. He's the Chief Economist, Centre for Financial Regulation, ISC, ICFR. And in Paris, Max Kaiser. He's an American filmmaker and former equities broker. Welcome to you all. Let's start with Philip Booth in London. To repeat, LIBOR is London interbank offered rate. I stress 
interbank, mm -hmm. that's 16 banks. How can mm -hmm. one bank get away with manipulating data? Well, it's a relatively small number of, of banks which are providing the information to the British Bankers Association who do the calculation of LIBOR. And if one of those um, banks um, decides to put in uh, false information, uh, then it can manipulate the rate either because it uh, affects the average or because their rate is such that it's not one of the rates which is chosen in order to uh, calculate the average. But it would appear that there isn't just one bank involved here. I think Barclays is ahead of the game in terms of reporting this to the FSA and, and also be in terms of being investigated. There is more to come here. Well, Richard Reid, also in London, your, your view of this. Is there a form of collusion involved? I think one has to see this in, in terms of various phases through LIBOR. I, I used to work in the industry and it was uh, under discussion five, six, seven years ago that perhaps uh, that LIBOR had become perhaps not the best, the most effective way of assessing what the costs of borrowing were truly between the banks. And that may have been because when it was originally set up, the financial system was much less complex than it became during the 2000s and therefore there was a, a fundamental argument to be to be had about whether or not this LIBOR was was the the best measure of in fact the cost of borrowing. Well, of course, it's changed into over the course of the last three or four years and and through the crisis has been this element of manipulation on the part of some of the banks uh, in order to produce, as you just heard. Uh, sort of numbers which would be beneficial to their activities. And then, of course, the final phase of this debate has been the relationship between the banks and the regulators. And this is one of the issues we'll be trying to get to the bottom of now over the next uh, few weeks, is what level of understanding was there between the banks and the regulators about the extent of the, if you like, the manipulation of these, of these LIBOR rates. This is something that we will pick up in a moment. But just to go to Max Kaiser on this initial question, is this just the tip of a massive financial iceberg? Well, once again, London is the center of a, a big banking scandal. Remember, we had AIG, Bernie Madoff, MF Global, uh, JP Morgan's recent uh, balance sheet transgressions happened in London, and now the LIBOR scandal. There's very little regulatory oversight in London. The global banking industry relies on London having virtually no regulatory oversight. The bulk of the global financial crimes occur in London. Uh, David Cameron, of course, is uh, keen to protect the franchise of the city of London. It's the big profit center for his country and his government, uh, p essentially peddling in fraud. And uh, it it's well known. Uh, this, this gap between the LIBOR rate and the market rate has been talked about for several years now by those who trade in the credit default swap market who have been complaining openly for years that there's obviously manipulation going on in the LIBOR market. But of course, the regulators look the other way, just like they did during the Bernie Madoff scandal and all these other scandals, because the regulators uh, are basically in the pocket of the banking industry. But even if they find someone doing something wrong, there's no, there's no real deterrent. There, there's no penalty. Barclays will pay uh, some kind of fine, but of course, to, to, to pay for the fine, they'll continue to engage in manipulation, in market manipulation and fraud. That's their business model, let's be honest. That's what their shareholders expect. That's what the uh, City of London expects. Well, let, let's just pick up here with Richard Reid on the first part of your answer there of London as some kind of center of fraud and, and corruption. What's your response to that, Richard Reid? Well, I think two things. I think it would be uh, extremely misleading to say that the, uh, the crisis has shown that only has there been uh, financial uh, uh, regulatory mistakes in London. I think it's quite clear that there's been the crisis has unveiled uh, a lack of supervision uh, in a number of centres, certainly not just in London. London, of course, is one of the biggest financial centres in the world, if not the biggest, and particularly in some kinds of instruments. And so, of course, uh, it tends to be exposed to some of these practices. And it is certainly the case that in the wake of the crisis, the British authorities uh, identified that there had been a degree of, if you like, regulatory underlap in that the, the the previous uh, period had focused on certain types of business activity and certain types of behaviour, but had been not set up to look at, at particular areas which have been uncovered in the wake of the crisis. I think it's important to bear in mind in the UK, the government has put in a, a lot of regulatory change since the crisis, and uh, the new structure of the, the regulators is very much aimed uh, at this question of uh, not just regulation. I think there's limits 
to what regulation can do. And there's much more emphasis now on supervision and enforcement. And I think that's where a lot of uh, change has to be made. I mean, I, I think there really does have to be a sense in which uh, if you are caught out in activity which you shouldn't be doing, that there's a sense in which you are likely to be caught. And moreover, not only are you likely to be caught, you're likely to be punished by it. And I think, I think that's where there's probably been uh, an, also a, an element that's been lacking, which is the sense that uh, in case of misdemeanor or, or, or activity, which has been counter to what the regulators or even, or even uh, uh, law would, would require, there's a sense in which there has been a failure to sort of see that and pick it up and punish it. And I think we're moving in, we, I mean, to be, to be fair, the government here and the authorities here are prosecuting, they are giving custodial sentences, but I think we're going to see as a result of particularly the last week, I think we're, we're going to see much more emphasis put on precisely that, much more strict supervision and enforcement, no doubt about it. Well, well, let's just uh, pause here and take a look at this whole issue of regulation. Banks that help set interbank lending rates have been scrutinized by various regulatory bodies for years. Their function precisely to watch for manipulations in the LIBOR and similar rates. In the UK, the Financial Services Authority, or FSA, regulates providers of financial services. So far, the financial watchdog has found only one bank guilty of misconduct. This after repeated warnings in the past five years in irregularities of how LIBOR is set. The European Commission has also been investigating fraud on interbank rates. The EU antitrust regulators say they are now intensifying scrutiny on financial markets, but are yet to declare any irregularities. LIBOR and its Euro equ equivalent, Eurobor, are regarded as key benchmark rates throughout the world, impacting on virtually every currency, not just euros and sterling. So the question here is, should some international body be regulating the regulators of a system that appears to assume that everyone acts honestly? And Philip Booth, should the emphasis be on legal rather than regulatory sanction? In other words, make manipulation a crime rather than some moral mistake. Yes, I, I really don't understand the uh, point of view which suggests that somehow London is a very lightly regulated market and that's where, why all this fraud and uh, these misdemeanors take place because here. Because that's uh, the reality of the about... situation, okay? Stop piddling yeah, that well, lie. Okay, Stop hold on one moment, Max. Okay, Let's let Philip Booth finish it. There's screen, no regulation. We can, we can rehypothecate to infinity in London. Max Stop Kaiser, telling lies. Max Kaiser, okay, I'll, you, I'll give you your say in a moment. Because panel members like that are lying. I'll give you your say in a moment. Max Kaiser in Paris, let's just hear, let's like just that. hear from London Philip, let Philip Booth, con There's no let Philip Booth finish his point. Bank of England is totally implicated in this scandal. Philip, the please continue. Yeah, the, the, um, uh, um, the, the FSA probably has about a million paragraphs of financial regulations re relating to banks and other financial institutions. And a, a company such as HSBC, for example, has a, about over 3,000 compliance officers. There's no shortage of regulation writing here. But I think what has taken place uh, in, in this case, um, you know, if, if um, a, 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 assuming investigations co confirm uh, what we suspect, and certainly what took place in the case of the Bernie Madoff scandal and so on, uh, are straightforward examples of uh, civil and, um, uh, and, and criminal fraud. And these things are best dealt with, in, in my view, in a sort of common law legal framework where they will be um, prosecuted and those who uh, under, undertook, these, um, uh, undertook these actions uh, were, were actually I don't know, either sent to prison or, or fined huge amounts. The individuals concerned are fined uh, huge amounts in particular, and of course where there is uh, general corporate compliance, the corporation is also uh, fined huge amounts. But if you go back to um, before 1986, when uh, the, uh, the predecessor of the FSA was firstly set up, Markets used to generate their own forms of regulation, and actually the reputation of the participants in uh, financial markets at that time was one of the most important factors uh, when deciding whether to uh, deal with this or that person or this or that institution. And we've moved away from that and moved away to a, moved to a position where we believe that we can somehow um, perfect markets with state regulators writing more and more rules. And I'm afraid it hasn't worked. And it's not just not, just not worked here. If you look at countries such as Spain, Ireland, um, there may well be more to come in, in, in Germany and, and Italy, there have been huge mistakes uh, made by um, people within the banking uh, industry in terms of lending money they shouldn't have lent 
uh, and, and so on. And the best way to deal with this is to ensure that they can be uh, held to account for uh, criminal and civil offences uh, and also held to account for the financial uh, uh, consequences of, of their mistakes uh, by the market itself. Well, well, Philip Booth, at this point, let's go back to Max Kaiser in Paris and allow him to vent his anger in, in a proper order here. Max Kaiser? Well, it's absurd to suggest that some kind of proper regulatory framework is in place, and this is just a mild transgression. We have a hardened syndicate, a racket going on between Mervyn King, Barclays, other banks around the world, to massage interest rates lower to help their speculative positions. Meanwhile, savers, people with real monies, people who have capital, people who have pensions, are being penalized. People, you know, Osborne is out there saying, well, we need to penalize more of the pensioners. We have to take more from them because they haven't participated in this austerity so far. They've been underwriting the austerity. Savers, the real capitalists in society, have been underwriting the speculators like Bob Diamond and Barclays, Mervyn King, and all the friends of George Osborne. So you need to understand that this crisis is a crisis is now of central banking because the Bank of England has now been implicated in this scandal for trade and manipulating interest rates. That's well, a whole other magnitude of crisis above and beyond. Just well, let me put that magnitude of crisis, committing Max. fraud, like Barclays fraud. Well, Max Kaiser, let, let's put that Excuse magnitude me? of crisis on, on to Richard Reed. We hear there the accusation now the Bank of England is involved in some deep-seated uh, financial manipulations. Well, I, th I think the public not just in the UK, but in a number of countries, is rightly um, feeling that very few heads have seen to roll in the wake of this financial crisis. There is a sense in which a lot of members of the public have felt mugged by the financial system for one reason or another. I do think, however, in the current climate, it's important to try, I know this is hard, but I think we have to try and separate out the bad parts of the financial system and the parts which have not been well regulated with other parts of the financial system which have not been implicated in this and which, which provide genuinely useful functions to both savers and borrowers. And I think there is a danger that it, precisely at these moments that we tar the whole industry with one brush. Now with this point about the, the central banks, of course the central banks are intimately intertwined with the banking system. I think, however, one has to be extraordinarily careful about statements which say that any central bank has connived in the manipulation of rates to the detriment of the final users of the financial system. It's quite clear, as I think Mr. Booth and I have both expressed the view, that there have been not just regulatory lapses, but lapses in, in terms of supervision and enforcement. And I think it is also quite clear that the authorities recognize that this has been a catastrophic uh, period for the banking system well, and that it has to be fixed. Let, let, let me go there to Philip no, Booth at, no at this fixes, particular point. Think. Sorry, if, if on, I may, Let me just Richard. finish this point. Let yes. Me, finish the yeah. point. I was just going to say, there are no quick fixes on this, I'm afraid. And, uh, you know, I think the idea that somehow that we can turn this around on a sixpence or, a, you know, turn around very quickly are mistaken. But I think, I think what this past week has served, it has served, I think, as a very strong impetus now that there will be a lot more effort put on this, 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 this point about uh, bringing people to book for, for behavior that has been unacceptable. Well, I think let's, that's take, let, let's, let's take that particular point, Richard Reed. I want to go to Philip Booth now, and then afterwards we'll go to Max Kaiser in, in Paris. But the point that we heard there about it's possible to separate the good from the bad, the insistence that there are good sectors and that there are bad sectors. Mm -hmm. In other words, we're talking about rotten apples here, not the whole barrel. Is that mm. your view as well? Mm. It is. And also, it's important to bear in mind that there are big ethical failings here. Now, both the Bernie Madoff case is, is obvious, but also in the LIBOR um, uh, setting issue, clearly there are big ethical cases. People are doing things which are dishonest or have, have been doing things which are uh, dishonest and wrong. And regulatory tools are pretty bad ways to deal with ethical failings in most walks of, of, of life. And I think that is a serious problem that we have to, um, that, that we have to own up to as well. And we have to go back to a situation, really, when people don't want to deal with other people who are behaving in an unethical uh, way. And uh, that will only be the case when we have a financial system where, once again, people take for the financial consequences uh, of their own decisions, a financial uh, system which is not so underwritten by the, the, the state as the current financial system is, a financial system which is not continually bailed out um, uh, by the state, with the state and the financial system being in each other's pockets. That's possibly something that Max and I uh, can, can agree with and, and so on. So that 
that when I, when I travel by um, an airline and I choose between Ryanair, EasyJet and British Airways, these companies diff have different reputations for different aspects of the packages of services that they, um, that they offer. And I, and I choose between those companies on the basis of their reputations. I hardly ever choose between a financial services company on the basis of financial services companies on the basis of their on the basis of their reputations because the financial services companies are so regulated that I, if I get that decision wrong I don't actually take the consequences uh, of um, m my own actions and my own choices. But let's go to Max Kaiser at this particular can point. Just, uh, we have talked you using sorry, the example ask? for example of, of choosing from airlines but the uh, point of view we're hearing from Paris, it would appear, is that all airlines uh, would be corrupt. Your, your view, Max Kaiser. All right. The entire banking system, $800 trillion in derivatives and various other uh, associated contracts, referred to LIBOR. LIBOR is the foundation upon which the global financial system rests, and it's been corrupted. They're manipulating LIBOR. Uh, Barclays is doing it to feather its own pocket in an illegal manner. And also the Bank of England. If you go back to 2008, there are emails from Gordon Brown's uh, economic advisor to the Bank of England suggesting that they lower interest rates as part of the reaction to the 2008 crisis. That is market manipulation. That is going past the uh, market as a function of free market capitalism, and now you are entering rigged market capitalism. Unfortunately, we are faced with the prospect today of there are no banks that are immune from this scandal because they are all participating to some degree, either directly or indirectly. And this goes back to whether we want a capitalist system that where the market determines prices or whether we want a command and control system like Mervyn King wants. He has a, some kind of Soviet idea of how to run an economy where his, his uh, open market committee but, sets interest rates. But briefly, Max Kaiser, Max Kaiser, you're, you're, if, if, if let, I can let, ask, let the then what, what, what should be done? What should be done, do you believe? Let the market find its own rates, let capitalism prevail, and don't try to step in there and micromanage these markets and manipulate markets in a way that looks very much like you're racketeering with your friends at Barclays who incidentally report profits tied to this interest rate manipulation. That's well, one scandal. The other scandal is you're, you're, you're thumbing your nose at capitalism. That's a huge scandal. It's, if, it's as if Britain can't make it on its own as a capitalist country. They, they want to be subsidized all the time by manipulation. Well, well Max if Kaiser, let's, let's, just, pre, let, let's just put, put, put own, the question here to Philip Booth, if, if I may. If I may, Max. Uh, th th Philip Booth, uh, th th there may be areas there that, that, that you agree with that question. You cannot have government uh, intervention in this. Absolutely, and this is, this is happening in other areas of the financial system as well. If you go back to the uh, origins of the crisis and the securitization of mortgages by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, effectively underwritten by the US government, the bailing out of AIG, which um, probably uh, uh, saved Goldman Sachs from uh, uh, the, the fate which Lehman Brothers eventually, uh, um, eventually befell Lehman Brothers. Um, and of course, within the European uh, Union, you've got governments bailing out banks who are bailing out governments who are bailing out but banks. But what, what, what should and, be done very so briefly, Philip and, Booth? What should be done? Um, well, I, I think we should get back to a financial system which is governed by the rule of law rather than, by, uh, rather than governed by um, uh, financial regulators who are writing millions of paragraphs of regulation with c compliance officers uh, in banks uh, who are... Um, uh, who are seeing whether or not all the right regulatory boxes are ticked. In addition to that, we have to accept that there, uh, that there should be good ethical standards of behaviour within banks and that that is something which, uh, if it doesn't exist, that, that, that's a, a very serious problem. But ethical standards cannot be regulated into well, existence. Well, very quickly, Richard Reid, uh, also in London, is uh, maintaining ethical standards enough. What do you think should be done? Well, uh, let me come to that in one second. I think... One has to be, uh, you know, I go back to this point about blanket condemnations of the financial system. I, I really do think that these sorts of comments are, are not helpful, they're not constructive. And with specific reference, for example, to that uh, communication between Gordon Brown and the Bank of England, I think that's very much a case, that's, a, that, that's why I wanted to distinguish between different phases of this LIBOR debate, because that was much more in the context of the government going to the banking system and saying, look, 
we're in a crisis period. We're trying to provide but, but you with funds. what should be done, funds, Philip Booth? We, we, want to see. we understand the reference there, well, but what should be yeah, done? Hold on one second. No, I think it's very... I, hold on. It's, it, we've had a couple of very strong rem remarks here which have to, be, have to be counted with fact. That, in fact, was a situation where the authorities were trying to make sure that precisely the people who use the financial system were able to benefit from some of the improved credit uh, supply that was coming to the banks. So that was, I think that was a different situation. What should be done? I think absolutely this question of accountability and transparency really have to be improved upon. Well, at that point, thanks to our guests in London, Philip Booth, also in London, Richard Reed, and in Paris, Max Kaiser. And thank you for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. If you want to send us your feedback, email your thoughts to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. Thanks again for watching. I'm Mike Hanna. Goodbye for now.